A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The desert and the parched land will exult. The steppe will rejoice and bloom. They will bloom with abundant flowers and rejoice with joyful song. The glory of Lebanon will be given to them, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the hands that are feeble. Make firm the knees that are weak. Say to those whose hearts are frightened, be strong, fear not. Here is your God. He comes with vindication. With divine recompense, he comes to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf be cleared. Then will the lame leap like a stag. Then the tongue of the mute will sing. Streams will burst forth in the desert and rivers in the steppe. The burning sands will become pools and the thirsty ground springs of water. The abode where jackals lurk will be a marsh for the reed and the papyrus. A highway will be there called the Holy Way. No one unclean may pass over it, nor fools go astray on it. No lion will be there, nor beast of prey go up to be met upon it. It is for those with a journey to make, and on it the redeemed will walk. Those whom the Lord has ransomed will return and enter Zion singing, crowned with everlasting joy. They will meet with joy and gladness. Sorrow and mourning will flee. Verbum da meaning. Our God will come to save us. I will hear what God proclaims. The Lord, for he proclaims peace to his people. Near indeed is his salvation to those who fear him, glory dwelling in our land. Kindness and truth shall meet. Justice and peace shall kiss. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and justice shall look down from heaven. The Lord himself will give his benefits. Our land shall yield its increase. Justice shall walk before him, and salvation along the way of his steps. Dominos vobiscum. Et tu spiritu tu. Lectio Sancti Evangelii secundum Lucam. Gloria a ti, Domine. One day as Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea, and Jerusalem were sitting there, 
and the power of the Lord was with him for healing. And some men brought on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and set him in his presence. But not finding a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on the stretcher through the tiles into the middle in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, as for you, your sins are forgiven. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to ask themselves, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who but God alone can forgive sins? Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them in reply, what are you thinking in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to one who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your stretcher and go home. He stood up immediately before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. Then astonishment seized them all, and they glorified God. And struck with awe, they said, we have seen incredible things today. Verbum Domini. It is clear from today's gospel account of the healing of the paralytic that Jesus Christ came into this world to heal the paralysis of sin, the paralysis of the world. The same gospel account of the healing of the paralytic lower down through the roof, as in St. Mark and St. Matthew's Gospel is read here through St. Luke. We read through his lens this morning. And St. Luke, being a physician, a doctor, would have had an even more sharp awareness of the miracles of Jesus, especially when it came to miracles of healing of the body. Going back to the original sin of our first parents, we were deprived of God's life dwelling within us. This is where paralysis enters into the picture in salvation history, the original sin. Before the original sin, Adam and Eve enjoyed sanctifying grace, that is, friendship with God. No paralysis, an inner harmony within themselves and within each other, and that harmony with God's creation. The original sin of our first parents, of Adam especially, severed this harmony. It put an infinite gap between man and God. Only God himself could have healed that infinite gap, that chasm that separated man from God. God the Son was sent by God the Father and assumed a human nature, thus becoming the new Adam, to redeem and to reconcile all mankind back to God and to heal the paralysis, to heal what was shattered to heal that chasm from the original sin, the new Adam is the one who reconciles and heals and draws all men to himself by the shedding of his blood on the cross. The church that Jesus Christ founded on Peter and the apostles almost 2,000 years ago is 
and will always be a hospital for paralytics, a hospital for sinners. We still suffer the effects of original sin, but through the sacraments instituted by Christ, we have the power through grace, through the sacraments, to heal this paralysis in our lives. The men in the gospel that brought the paralytic to Jesus went to the extreme to bring him into the presence of the divine physician, the one that could heal their paralysis, his paralysis, all of their paralysis. Notice they did not come screaming to Jesus, heal this man. Jesus knew exactly who they were bringing to him. In bringing this paralytic into close proximity to Jesus, these men were exercising what we would now call the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Faith in that they were responding to the divine initiative. They were responding to God. God is what drew them there. Faith is man's response to God's invitation. These men had a vision beyond mere human sight. Hope in that they had enough trust and confidence that in bringing the paralytic to Jesus, he would heal them. He is the antidote. Charity, in that their motivation was not out of selfishness or self-centeredness, but a love that originated ultimately from the one whom they were bringing him to encounter. That love that impelled them to bring the paralytic to Jesus was the love that originated from the Lord himself. It was love that drew love out of them. These men carried the paralytic into the presence of Jesus shows us that all three virtues, faith, hope, and charity, are meant to work together in unison. They're never really meant to live or to operate in harmony outside of one another. They really can't. These virtues of faith, hope, and charity are meant to be the lifeblood of the Christian. True faith is anchored in hope and animated by charity. Jesus saw their faith and as God was moved by their faith in him, Jesus' first prerogative was to heal this man's soul, the salvation of his soul, the interior. Notice the two healings that take place. The first being the forgiveness of his sins, and then being the healing of the exterior paralysis healing of body. A healing that is unseen is first, the soul. And the healing that is seen, his paralysis, his un inability to walk, was second. Jesus makes it clear the order of importance the interior, the interior life, that which is unseen, that which is only seen really by God himself. God sees the heart. God sees the mind. The exterior healing of paralysis is important in this case, but it's secondary. Even though an exterior healing took place without the forgiveness 
of sins, the paralytic would still be paralyzed interiorly. Interior was the most important thing. One commentator says, what good would it do for you to receive a relative strength from outside if the heart of you remained paralyzed, that which is inside? In some sense, each of us suffers from paralysis. Some of our viewers suffer from a tremendous exterior paralysis. But most likely, interiorly, they are not suffering from the paralysis that some are. Some suffer the paralysis of many different physical complications. But that being said, in their heart, in their minds, they're more reconciled to God than anyone. If you are one of those who has some sort of exterior paralysis, know that your suffering is not in vain. Know that any exterior paralysis that you experience in this life is not in vain, that it's seen by God. And I dare say even can be used by God for the salvation of not only your own soul, but for the soul's of many for the salvation of the world. Jesus desires us to have that same type of ardent faith, that steadfast hope and burning charity that the men had carrying the paralytic in the gospel. He desires us to come before him with our own spiritual paralysis, our own struggles, our own weaknesses, our own sinfulness, and to beg him to heal us. He also desires not just us, but like these men did, he wants us to bring others to him, to carry others to him for healing. Not just in our prayers, but we can say very quite literally. And during this time, perhaps when so many people are fear-stricken because of our current crisis, maybe they're afraid to come on their own to church, to come to, on their own to go to confession. It's an opportunity maybe for you to bring them, to encourage them, to say, I will take you. We will do things safely. But in my experience, most parishes that I know of are more clean than any store that you're probably currently going to. People do a good job of cleaning parishes, of sanitizing. So there really is, in some respects, not, there shouldn't be fear in coming to a church, to bringing our own needs into the presence of Jesus, and to ask somebody perhaps that you know who can't get there, ask them if you can bring them yourself, to be like these two men bringing the paralytic to Jesus. St. Ambrose, whose memorial is today, comments on the healing of the paralytic. St. Ambrose says, in this place, he shows a complete picture of the resurrection. Since healing the wounds of the soul and body, he remits the sins of souls. He drives out the infirmity of the body. It means that the whole man is healed. Since how great it is to forgive men their sins, for who can forgive sins but God alone, who can also remit them by those to whom he has given the power to deliver? Yet it, yet it is much more divine to give resurrection to bodies since the Lord himself is the resurrection. 
Simply put, St. Ambrose asserts that we are given a glimpse of resurrected life in this healing. Although the paralytic will surely taste death and possibly even suffering again in his life sometime in the future, this moment of interior and exterior healing shows us in part just what a perfect integrated life will be like in eternity. When body and soul will be reunited after the resurrection from the dead. St. Ambrose says, mighty is the Lord who pardons one man for the good deed of another. And while he approves of the one, forgives the other his sins. Why, O oh man, with you does not your fellow men prevail? With God a servant has both the liberty to intercede in your behalf and the power of obtaining what he asked. He says, if you despair of the pardon of heavy sins, bring the prayers of others. Bring the church to pray for you. And at sight of this, the Lord may pardon what man denies you. It's very powerful. Some people are crushed by their current situations, not just exterior par paralysis, but many people are crushed by the heaviness of their own sins, that sense of being crushed inside. If you're one of those people, call on the intercession of the church. And during the Mass, we pray for the intercession of, for the salvation of the entire human race. The healing of the paralytic shows the power of intercession. What the paralytic could not accomplish by himself was brought about by the communion of believers. The church bringing him before the divine physician. Two men bringing him before the only one who could truly heal them. And this should be encouraging Yes, we are all saved as individuals, but we are never saved apart from incorporation into Christ's mystical body, the church. We are never just isolated islands by ourselves, but we're meant to be in cooperation with one another as his mystical body. After many tears shed over her son, St. Monaco's prayers were answered. Ambrose was sent into her son Augustine's life. Ambrose brought about healing and brought about healing to the paralysis of Augustine's life. What Augustine could not do for himself, Ambrose, by his intercession, brought about. It can be said without St. Ambrose, there would be no St. Augustine, in other words. How powerful. The intercession of the church is so powerful. Bring your own paralysis and the paralysis of your loved ones and unite them to the intercession of Holy Church, to the prayers of Holy Church. Simply put, Jesus Christ is the medicine that the church will administer. He's a divine physician, both the divine physician and the medicine, the antidote for all paralysis.